Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. These are words spoken by the crowds in Jerusalem as Jesus entered on that Palm Sunday. And today in Palm Sunday we begin a special week in the calendar of believers. Our focus is upon Jesus going to Calvary and suffering and dying for our salvation. Welcome to the members of Akudu and Crossgar congregations and to all others who will gather by means of internet. It's good to be able to lead our thoughts at this time. And we do pray that God will lead and guide by his spirit as we join together. And I thank others who will share in this service of worship. But as we come to God, we are conscious that we need his blessing and his help. So let us join in prayer. Father, as we come to you, we thank you that you are a loving and gracious God. We praise you for your goodness and love. And we thank you that you are a God who supplies all our needs. You have given your son Jesus to be our saviour. We thank you that you sent him to the cross to suffer and to die for our sin. And we praise you that he is the risen, exalted saviour. We come in and through Jesus Christ, through the merits of his shed blood. We recognise and confess that we have no merit of our own. But Lord, we claim the work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. We think of Daniel, and as Daniel came to you in prayer, he acknowledged that he didn't come because of any righteousness of his own, but because of your great mercy. Lord, you are a merciful and loving God. You are a faithful and an unchanging God. And Lord, we can never truly comprehend your greatness. But we praise you that you're sovereign over all. And you care for each one of us. Lord, help us indeed to trust you fully. To love you with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. We thank you for all that you have done for us and all that you have won for us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. And Lord, we acknowledge as we come to you that we are sinners in need of your grace. We continually feel you in all that we think and say and we do. And Lord, we ask that you would draw near by your Spirit. We pray that you would purify us afresh and help us to be those who follow you wholeheartedly like Caleb of old. Help us to put Christ first and to serve him faithfully. We pray for your blessing upon us as we meditate upon your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you and praise you for its relevance. And we pray that each of us will be encouraged and blessed as we will share together. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. You will have probably heard of an author and pastor in America called Tim Keller. And Tim Keller has been the author of many books. Um, one of those books is this title, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. Of course, very relevant for our current situation. But in that book, he makes this statement. Suffering is unbearable if you aren't certain that God is for you and with you. Suffering is unbearable if you aren't certain that God is for you and with you. There's much suffering and pain in our world today. And of course, that leads to some people asking the question, where is God in all of this? Why does he not put an end to this awful suffering? But of course, the classic argument of atheists is that if God is powerful and loving, then there would be no suffering in the world. And they conclude that either God is not truly all powerful and he can't remove suffering, or he's not a loving God and he doesn't care about the distress and pain of his people. We know the Bible affirms that God is both. He is all powerful. He is sovereign over all. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. But he's also a loving and a gracious God. He cares for his people. Indeed, over and over again in Scripture, we are reminded of his constant care. And that care and that love never wavers. He loves us as much in the good times as he does in the bad. He loves us as much in the dark times as in the bright times. God is faithful. 
generous and loving. Since the onset of this coronavirus and pandemic, we have not been able to meet in church buildings. And up to that point, I was leading our congregations in the study of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And Philippians, we were looking at the, under the title of Joy No Matter What. But for a few weeks, I felt led to look at other passages and other verses in Scripture for our encouragement and to help to give us perspective. And the first of those uh, two weeks ago was found in Joshua. And there we thought a great, a great blessing, the blessing of God's presence. Do you see, at that time, Joshua was perplexed and worried. He was facing something that seemed to be overwhelming, going into the promised land. And God made a wonderful promise. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. He offered reassurance. It was a great blessing, a blessing of God's presence. Then last Sunday, we looked at a great need. And we studied the prayer of Jehoshaphat at a time of crisis. And Jehoshaphat feels real difficulty, a real crisis. But he didn't panic. He went to God. And he confessed that he didn't know what to do. But he declared his eyes were on God. And that's what we need to do at this time. To look to God, to focus on him for help and encouragement. A great blessing, a great need. And God's will next week and on Easter Sunday we will look at a great hope. The hope for all believers. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus rose victorious from the grave. And that is the guarantee that those who know Christ will be raised to eternal life in heaven. But today I feel directed by God to think about another very familiar verse, and it's found in the book of Romans and verse 28. And it is a verse that speaks about God's sovereignty and God's love and God's work on our behalf. And if you like, it's a verse that speaks about a great assurance or a great confidence. God is working continually for us. And we're going to hear that passage read to us, beginning at verse 28 and going to the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 8, from verse 28 to the end of that chapter. Today's reading is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you to Gemma for reading those verses to us. Very familiar passage of scripture and particularly verse 28 in which the reading commenced. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. It's a great verse. It brings you comfort for the Christian. And in that, we get a glimpse of God's sovereignty. God is in control of all things. 
Not only do we get a glimpse of God's sovereignty, but also we discover our security. And our security is not in the events of this life, good or bad. Our security is in the everlasting purpose of God. But before we consider this powerful assurance to believers, we must be careful to appreciate what this verse does not teach. And let me point out several things. First of all, it's not the intention of Paul, the author, to give a precise explanation of all suffering. It doesn't present uh, it doesn't pretend to solve the riddles of life. And secondly, it does not imply that Christians will never suffer. And that's important that we understand this. You see, there are some that suggest this verse tells us if we believe in God, if we love God, well, we'll have a life of great blessings. That's incorrect and dangerous. Remember in verse 18, Paul wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. So certainly the Christian will suffer. It's not a prohibition against grieving or sorrow either. The Bible never asks us to pretend that tragedy is anything but tragedy or to pretend that pain isn't real. Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, wept at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend. Another thing we should understand is that this verse, Romans 8, 28, does not tell us that everything is good. It tells us everything will be worked for our good by God, but it doesn't say everything is itself good. We can think of many things that are not good. The death of a young child is not good. The early onset of dementia is not good. The loss of our job is not good. And there are many, many other things that in and of themselves are not good. Even before this coronavirus crisis, many people often commented that if you listen to the news bulletins, if you took away the bad news, well, there was very little of that remained. And the truth is we live in a world where there's much comfort, discomfort and much suffering and much pain. It is a fallen world. And it's true and fair to say and accurate that there is much that is not good in itself. So this verse doesn't teach that all suffering and all tragedy is good in of itself. If it doesn't offer an exact explanation of why God permits some tragedy to come, if it doesn't tell us that everything will work out simply if we have enough faith, then what does, what does it teach us? Well, I love the way Ray Pritchard puts it. It's very helpful, this perspective. He says he is erecting a sign over the unexplainable mysteries of life, a sign that reads, quiet, God at work. How? We're not always sure. To what end? Good and not evil. That's what Romans 8, 28 is really saying. And he goes on to offer this interesting and useful illustration. Think about children at night. They become afraid of the dark. And the child may cry out in the darkness to his dad to come. And then dad will come and sit on the end of the bed, take the child in his arms and say, don't be afraid, I'm right here with you. Well, the fear has gone away because daddy has come. And even so, the darkness of life frightens us until we discover that our heavenly father is there. And Pritchard adds, the darkness is still dark, but he is there and that makes all the difference. Let me encourage us from this verse to appreciate that God is there and God is at work in our lives. If you are a true child of God, he's at work in the bad times and the good times. Let me suggest four reasons why we can have confidence and assurance. First of all, the believer's assurance can be based upon a certainty. Paul writes in verse 28, we know, we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him. And that's a contrast to two verses earlier, verse 26, where he says, we do not know what to pray for. We do not know how to pray, but we know God has a purpose. Now notice here, we have an unshakable and absolute confidence by the apostle Paul, we know. We didn't begin and we think, we didn't begin and we hope and we wish or even and we feel. No, and we know. And there's a huge difference between feeling and knowing. 
We might be feeling exactly the opposite of what God is actually doing. We might feel that God is not in control. We might feel that God does not love us, but he does. He loves us beyond our comprehension. Think about verse 32. Paul says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will not also along with him graciously give us all things? And at this time of year coming up to Easter, we remember how Jesus was nailed to the cross, how he was punished for our sin as if he had committed them. And that happened so that God could take the righteousness of Christ and place it on those who repent and trust in Jesus as Savior and adopt them as his children. And that is surely undeniable proof of the absolute and unconditional love of God. The cross affirms, it proves that God loves us. We know that all things work together for good. The story is told of a lady on one occasion being at a Christian conference. She had the misfortune of breaking her hip. And she commented it to her pastor. I don't see how this will work for my good. He paused for a moment and then very simply replied. The verse you're referring to in Romans says, we know all things work together for good, not we see that all things work together for good. You see, our problem is often we don't see, so we don't appreciate how a thing can be good for us. And we often we look at things and analyze things in the short term. We calculate differently from God. And in addition, we surely have a different concept from God as to what is good. We think of good as related to health and happiness. But as we will see a little later, God has a different calculation, a different understanding and appreciation of what is good for us. But the key to experiencing a solid confidence and assurance that all things ultimately will work out for our good is that we understand circumstances in the light of who God is rather than understanding God in the light of circumstances. Paul here says, we know. We know that all things work together for good. And that we know is not based on personal experience by Paul. That's not the word that is used. Rather, it's based on truth. We know that God's in control because he said he is. And we trust his word. The believer's assurance based on a certainty. But secondly, the believer's assurance, the believer's confidence based on a comprehensive promise. Paul says, we know that in all things, God works together for good for those who love him. And that phrase, all things, is comprehensive. It's utterly, totally, absolutely, entirely comprehensive. Someone said, the good, the bad, and the ugly things of life, well, God takes them all and he uses them for his eternal purpose. The phrase together or work together is one word in the Greek from it, we get our English word synergy. And what is synergy? It is what happens when you put two or more elements to form something brand new that neither could form separately. And that is illustrating for us that God uses all the circumstances in our life, the good, the bad, the ugly, to create something that could not have been created without all of those elements. Now, individually, some of those elements are not good. Some of those elements are not pleasant, but they're used by God for his purpose. The illustration is sometimes given of table salt. It is made up of two elements of sodium and chloride. And those who have some knowledge will know that sodium on its own is dangerous to ingest. But of course, you can't have salt unless you have both sodium and chloride. God says all things work together for good. And for honest, we struggle with that. It seems too definite to wide all things. We might say, fair enough, some things work together for good. Or we might say, well, I can understand how some difficulty has taught me important lessons that I would never have learned apart from that. But all things, surely all things can be for our good. But our problem often is that we judge the end from the beginning. 
Or to be more exact, we judge what we cannot see by what we do see. We judge what we cannot see and cannot understand by what we do see and believe. And when tragedy strikes, if we don't see a purpose, we believe there is none. But that is not true. We ought to judge the beginning by the end. The purpose for God and everything is always good. And it offers the believer a great assurance to know the scope of this promise. All things. That's huge. And the saying that God orchestrates all things, working them together for the believer's good. And it means that whatever the motives are behind what comes into our life, righteous or sinful, God is still in control. And of course we see this in scripture. One powerful example often quoted is that of Joseph from the book of Genesis. He was betrayed by jealous brothers and sold into slavery. And in there he endured further difficulty. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He ended up in jail. And there he languished and was forgotten about. But of course God remembered him. And when he was reunited finally with his brothers, he declared to them, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. God sovereignly worked in all the circumstances of the life of Joseph for his good. The believer's assurance, the believer's confidence is based on the certainty. We know, we know that God works in Christians' lives for their good. It's based on the comprehensive promise. We know all things, in all things, God is at work. But then thirdly, the believer's assurance is based on a faithful controller. Paul here, the Apostle Paul, expresses his confidence that in all things, God's worked for the good of those who love him. Who is the one in control? Who is working? Who is sovereign? God. Now this verse is translated Differently in different versions. Let me share two of them with you. The New American Standard Version. And note how it puts it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. We know that God causes all things. The ESV. A little different. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose purpose you see what is this saying well things don't just happen to work out for good on their own god providentially works all things together for the good of his people according to his perfect divine purpose some people believe that life is a bit of a you just roll the dice some things go good some don't sometimes you win sometimes you lose and then if tragedy comes well they believe that god just turns up and it makes everything come out right. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It reminds us that God is there at the beginning. God is there at the end. And he is there at every point in between. God is at work. Not luck. Not chance. Not blind faith. God is at work in the lives of his children. And that answers the great question. Where is God when it hurts? Is he there at the beginning or is he only there at the end? Does he only turn up afterwards? The answer is surely God is there continually. He was there before it happened. When it happened, he is still there after it is all over. God knows the future and you know God's desires will always be accomplished. In the Old Testament you read, I make known the end from the beginning from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. My purpose will stand, says God. I will do all that I please. Even when things seem chaotic and out of control, God is still in charge. He is still sovereign. And we sometimes worry about what is happening to us because we don't know what is best for us, but God does. We are limited in our understanding. Is that not what God is saying in Isaiah 55? My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
we can't comprehend and understand and think as God does. Therefore, surely we must learn to trust him. We do not know what God is in the process of bringing about in our lives. But whatever is happening to us, if we are a child of God, we can be assured that God is working powerfully in our lives for our good. The believer's assurance is based on a certainty. I know, or we know, that God is working. It's an assurance, it's a certainty. The believer's assurance is based on the comprehensiveness of that promise. We know that in all things is comprehensive. It's based on the knowledge that God is in control. God is sovereign. God is working in our lives. And finally, the believer's assurance is based on the conclusion God has reserved. Verse 28 is a very powerful verse, but we need to read it in context because verse 29, well, that outlines the purpose that God has for us, those who are his children. We know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. The good that he's working towards, conformity, to his son, becoming Christ-like. And Paul in effect is saying something like this, God will intertwine and merge and fuse and blend and mingle and combine everything for your ultimate good so that you begin to reflect your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our good, our God's good for us is to become more like Jesus Christ. And you see, that's why we struggle, because you and I have a different understanding often of good from God. And what God has in view is conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. And he is going to bring that about through all the events of our lives, through prosperity and through adversity, through sickness and through health, through failure and through success, through darkness and through light, through joy and through sorrow he will continually be working with us to the great purpose of god towards which he is bringing every christian is not temporary happiness but conformity to the image of jesus christ his son god is not committed to making you and i happy he's not committed to making you and i successful in this world he's committed to making us like christ and whatever it takes to make us more like christ it is therefore good. Today, this is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Easter week. We turn our thoughts to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. And you see, Jesus perfectly illustrates this truth of God bringing ultimate good out of evil. Think about it. Jesus was betrayed. He endured an illegal trial. He was deserted by his closest friends. He was reviled, mocked, stripped, scourged, spat upon. He had to endure the painful and humiliating death of a cross. And in addition to all that, he took upon himself our sin. Yet, when we go back to Isaiah 53, we read it was the Lord's will to crush him. The things that Jesus endured were not good. But the purpose of God was that Jesus would suffer and die to bring salvation to all who would repent and believe. The devil and his cohorts, you know, were rejoicing when Jesus was nailed to the cross. But it was all part of God's plan of salvation, redemption. It was not a crushing defeat. But as Jesus rose victorious from the grave, it was a glorious, glorious victory. We quoted Tim Keller at the beginning. Suffering is unbearable if you don't. Know for certain that God is with you and for you. And today there are many who might question, is God really with us or for us? And maybe you're struggling with some painful circumstance in your life. Well, this verse offers hope to you and it offers hope to our world and our community. It offers a great assurance. We know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God is for you. And if you want proof, well, the cross of Christ is proof. And yet as I close, I want to point out that there is a limitation 
to this promise. God works for the ultimate good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. In other words, God works for the good, the ultimate good of every true born again Christian. It's not a blanket promise. It's not for those who are not believers. It's for those who have repented and trusted Christ as their saviour. And it's true to say that those who are unsaved may stay clear in this life of real sickness and hardship and calamity. But the reality is they will face something more dreadful one day if they remain in this condition. They will face separation from a holy, righteous, pure God eternally. But note how Paul concludes this section in which he's addressing Christians who are being persecuted and are facing uncertain times. Verse 27, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The things he's referring to in the previous verse, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, sword. No matter what is happening, we are more than conquerors if we know Jesus. And note how it continues. I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, the present or the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the great assurance of those who are saved, of those who, are, who have trusted in Christ as their saviour. God is at work for us now here in 2020 in the trials of our lives. And of course, it's also a promise that none of the tragedies of this world will ever separate us from eternal life and our eternal home in heaven. Paul says we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. A wonderful verse of assurance to the believer. And if you haven't committed your life to Christ and are trusting in him alone for salvation, well, consider your need of Jesus. Surely you need that assurance that there is one who is with you continually, one who loves you with an everlasting love, and one who will work every circumstance in this life for your good and for his glory. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for this wonderful verse. We thank you that it reminds us that you're sovereign. And we thank you that our security is found not in anything in this world, but in you. Help us to trust you and to rejoice in the wonderful assurance that you offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to share a little poem with you at this point, which I think is very appropriate for this particular portion of scripture. And it's found in a little booklet printed. And these poems were written many years ago by a lady called Jean Corbett. They were reprinted several times, most recently in 2018. And the title of the little book is Strength to Cope. Let me share just a little bit of the introduction because this lady, this little lady endured hard times herself. And this is what she writes. Sooner or later, all of us go through periods of testing, whether sickness, sickness or disability, bereavement or disappointment, uncertainty or other kinds of stress. Happy is the person who in such circumstances can find strength to cope through the grace of the one who endured the worst that life could bring and emerged triumphant. And among many of the poems there is one that relates to the passage from Romans chapter 8 and the title is More Than Conquerors and reminds us that if we know Christ as our Saviour, we have one who works for us and with him we can conquer all the trials of this life. Let me share it with you. More than conquerors. In all these things, in times of tribulation, in deep distress, or persecution sore, when famine threatens, nakedness or peril, we can be conquerors and more. Not scraping through, exhausted and impoverished, weakened and mutilated, when the battle is o'er, but winning gloriously with untouched resources, we must have conquerors and more. Through him that loved us, even in our weakness and our infirmities in his body bore. Through him who lives 
eternally triumphant, we shall be conquerors and more. And note the, trans the way the verses go there. We can be conquerors. Verse 1, we must be conquerors. And finally, we shall be conquerors. We can conquer all the trials and difficulties of this world. If we know Christ as our Savior, he is working in us and with us. And his aim is to mold us more and more into the image of Christ our Savior. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. You know, Father, that we are going through very trying times just now. Many are fearful and apprehensive. We don't understand what's going on. And we're shocked to hear of the many who are dying. We hurt to know of many who are suffering. Father, we feel for frontline medical staff who are so exposed and so uh, under so much pressure, many of them at their limits. And we cry out to you, Father, for help and hope. We pray that you will heal our land. We're aware that many in other lands have little or no medical support. And we cry out to you on their behalf. God of grace, Show us your mercy. We pray for our leaders and for world leaders that you will give them wisdom and vision. We pray for those who are engaged in medical research looking for a solution to this problem and we pray that you will inspire them and that this might be defeated speedily and effectively. Father, we thank you that even in these difficult circumstances, the thoughtfulness and kindness of so many people is coming to the surface. Inspire us as to what we might be doing in the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you for our church and for our minister, Knox Jones. We thank you, Father, for your word and for the assurance that no matter what we walk through, you are with us every step of the way. We thank you, Father, for the comfort of knowing that you are working it out for our good and for your glory. Help us to hold on to you and see the miracle of what you are doing. We thank you that in you we have hope for the present and for the future. We thank you that you are a God of compassion and the God of the cross and the God of resurrection. Breathe your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, across our land and across the world. We give you our thanks, our worship, and our praise and we ask these things in the powerful name of jesus christ amen i want to thank Gemma for reading the scripture and for james for leading us in prayer today and to highlight a few things for our folk in the congregations in akadu and crossgar First of all, this afternoon from 3 to 4 p.m. is a special time of prayer designated not just by the Presbyterian Church but by many other groups. And our moderator has provided material to guide and direct us. And of course, it is vital that we come in prayer for our land at this time. And then secondly, there will be no Good Friday service because of our current restrictions. But I encourage you as you come to this weekend to give thanks to God for all that Jesus has done for us. And in this will, we will meet again uh, through the internet next Sunday when we will be focusing particularly upon the wonderful, glorious resurrection of Jesus our Saviour. I also remind you that for our children, that Alice McCochran is continuing to do Sunday School Live at 10.30 
each Sunday morning through the avenue of Facebook. That has been a blessing, I know, to many. We thank her for that and for the work that she's doing. And also to acknowledge the work of Jill Gill also in helping with the web page and the various material that is going onto it week by week. So can I say that over this special week it'll be very different from Easter in past years, but can I wish you God's blessing? And can I encourage you through all the difficulties and through all the concerns to keep your focus upon Jesus, the one who came to offer us life eternal, who died for us and rose gloriously on that third day. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for being able to worship together by means of internet and CD. We thank you at this time, although no one is able to go to a building to worship you, we can worship you from our own homes. And we pray that this week, this special week in the Christian calendar, will remind us of your wonderful love. We thank you that you did not withhold your only son, but you freely offered him up as a ransom for our sin. We thank you that in Jesus there is hope, there is peace, there is joy, there is true satisfaction. And we thank you that you continually work for the good of your children. We ask, Lord, that we will continue to know your blessing. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion and our strength this day and indeed forevermore. Amen.